I'm calling to order the meeting of the Sunderland Elementary School Committee on January 11th at 6.01 p.m. Uh, first order of business is to review and approve the minutes of November 14th and November 28th, 2023. So moved. One second. Any discussion? All in favor? Yes. Four zero. Thank you. Financial statement. All right. Uh, so warrants signed since the November meeting uh, totaled $151,841.59, and there were 25 warrants. Um, oh, I have a typo in there, 24, and it's, it was through December 31st of 23, the expense reports I sent. So I'm like so honed in on some work. Um, I want to go over a couple of things just as a reminder, since we're like halfway through the year, I figure there's nothing new on here. Or there shouldn't be anything new that's showing overages, but I think it's a good point for us to kind of look at where we're at. Um, we still have about 8% of the budget not encumbered, so we're in good shape. We're not in any risk of you know, having a budget problem at this point. We fully encumbered salaries, which is why we're only seeing 8% at this point of the year because it accounts for all of those expenditures. Um, and one thing to keep in mind as you're looking through reports is that we're, we're a bottom line budget. So at the end of the year, as long as the budget is balanced, we're okay, even though you're seeing some negatives in some of the accounts. So I encourage you to look at subtotals as you go through this of a particular category because there could be you know, a thousand dollar overage in one line in a category and a thousand dollar savings in the same category. So while you're getting all of these line items in the end, it, it usually works out in the wash for us. Um, but a couple of big things to note is you'll see that the IA line, um, which is under function code 2330, and that falls on page three of the report on the budget, it's showing over. But if you look at the school choice report, there's money remaining in the school choice account. So one of the IAs is coded incorrectly. So I'll work with payroll to fix that. So we don't have an uh, actual overage of IAs. I expect we'll probably actually have some savings because of unpaid absences. Um, similar things happening in the teacher line. There is a regular teacher line that has um, more money than it should. It has 53,000. And then the special education teacher line is negative 49,000. So again, those things are washing each other out. I'll have to work with payroll to get that swapped out. Um, some true overages in the budget that, that do include telephone and trash. You know, utilities is one of those things that fluctuates year to year. Uh, so those are actual overages in those accounts. I think we're doing okay in buildings general repairs, at least as of this report. I think if we fast forward a few more weeks, there have been some things that have taken place, but I think we're in an okay spot with that at this point. We're not, <coughs> not in the red there yet, which is positive news. And we're having regular conversations about building facilities district wide and really keeping a close eye on things because Sunderland's not the only one that's seeing challenges with general repairs budgets. There's a lot of things going on district wide and with inflation, labor rates are up, you know, cost of materials is high. So, you know, we're really keeping a close account of all of those pieces. So um, that's all I have. I just wanted to open it so that if you all did have questions, you could ask them. You know, I hate to just keep saying there's no problems, no problems, and not at least talk a little bit about it. But I don't have anything further on this year unless you have questions. Is the McKinney Vento transportation situation ongoing? Yeah, good question. So that family did move back to their hometown, their house was rebuilt. And so we ended up spending 15000 on transportation for that student All right. versus the anticipated 30000 mm -hmm. Which is, which is why you have the possibility of using some of that rural aid for next mm -hmm. year. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I figured it must have, yep. something must have happened. Because. Yep. So you spent, you ended up spending 15 k Correct. And should there be a oh, reimbursement for the right. town? Probably I mean, not. Um, <laughs> that wasn't on nine C cuts either, but it could be one of the things that's <laughs> impacted. But um because of what the governor has reduced some stuff yeah right? um and I, I suppose we could submit for it and see if the town does get anything back out of it mm -hmm. um but we haven't been doing it in the past because the numbers been so small this year it was much more significant okay 
when it comes time to do end of year reporting, I'll be sure to throw that on the end of year report because that's how it funnels through. The state looks at the end of year report and then it gets submitted for reimbursement from there if you're eligible. Thank you. Great. Any other questions for Shelley? Thank you, Shelley. Uh, principal's report. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, so for the report today, I sent it to everyone on Monday, I believe. Um, but the first thing I wanted to talk about is a grants update. Um, we, as you know, we applied for the Cooler Communities Grant earlier in the year and were awarded around $3,000 to go towards our STEAM night event, which is happening in the last week of April. That um, night is going to focus on sustainability. And our library media specialist, Rachel Kidder, has been the driving force in um, taking the lead role in this event. Um, <clears throat> Rachel and I met recently, and uh, evening is going to showcase different uh, sustainability concepts, including sustainable gardening, home energy, reducing UE reuse, such as clothing and recycled art, low carbon eating, climate change and farming, transportation, climate and mental health. Um, we are looking to have some outside vendors um, from the community abroad to help support the evening. And then uh, across all grade levels, students are going to have different projects related to one or more of those sustainability concepts. So it's really exciting. Um, Rachel has put a ton of work into that, and she's just really one of the gems, one of the many gems we have here on our staff at, at Sunland. Uh, the other um, grant is our STARS residency grant. So earlier this school year, we applied for and received funding um, through the STARS residency grant program through the Massachusetts Cultural Council. Um, these residencies aim to bring students, teachers, artists, scientists, and humanists together um, in the spirit of creating rich cultural experiences. Uh, this year, we're going to welcome back talented mosaic artist, artist Cynthia Fisher. She's from Big Bang Mosaics. And, you know, if you walk in the main hallway by the by the office, we have a wetlands mosaic. Um, and Cynthia did the work with our students on that as well. And um, so this coming next week, actually, students across all grade levels are going to create a mural, mosaic mural with and Ms. Fisher, that celebrates the diversity found in our school community. Our goal is to have that um, up and on display for our international night event, which is happening in the last week of January. And our teacher, Melissa Ravel, and Vicki Palmer, our school psychologist and counselor, helped to secure funding for this grant. Um, our new school adjustment counselor, Jillian Buck, has thrived in her short time here at Sunderland Elementary School. In addition to partnering with families and connecting with students and staff, she's focused on the overall uh, health and well being of our school community. And prior to the December break, uh, she, along with Vicki, helped to plan a fun, a fun week for staff and students. And one of the fun days for students was they had to find uh, gingerbread people hidden throughout the school. And if each class, the classes that found, three gingerbreads were awarded a games outside with me and hot chocolate. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to report that all classes made <laughs> the, uh, the gingerbreads. <laughs> um, we didn't want to hear feelings, so <laughs> we had plenty out there. Uh, so community connections led by Mr. Max Sherrill, the Frontier Regional Band came to SES and rocked out the gymnasium for students and staff that happened before our winter break. Um, I mentioned this before, our International Night Celebration is scheduled for Thursday, January 25th. It kicks off at 5 p.m. with a wonderful potluck dinner, and we'll have some um, pizza on hand as well as, as fillers. Uh, families are encouraged to bring dishes that uh, celebrate their, um, their backgrounds. And this is being organized by Vicki Palmer. Uh, she's really taken the lead role in this event over the years. Additionally, a new feature this year, our music teacher, Susan Matsui, who, um, and I wanna I mention her in a, a little bit as well. Um, she lived in Japan for a number of years and 
has created numerous children's books in Japanese. So she's going to have a couple readings of one of the books that she wrote. And so that's going to be a new feature. Uh, we have a musical guest, Rick Marshall, who will showcase instruments from around the world. Um, Sue Matsui also is the strings teacher over at Frontier. And while we were looking for to fill that strings vacancy, she served as the longtime strings substitute here at Sunderland. And that transition happened on Monday. We have a new strings teacher, Mia Friedman, and um, connected with the kids immediately. Uh, my own daughter in Deerfield is in third grade, um, has had a couple of lessons with her, and um, she just has demonstrated a great rapport with the students. So, uh, and finally, uh, happy trails, Miss Flora Cox, our long-term kindergarten instructional assistant, Flora Cox, recently retired at the beginning of January. Flora began her career at Sunderland Elementary School during the 2005-2006 school year. Uh, while at SES, Flora has supported countless number of students with a loving approach. Uh, she has always had a deep love for gardening and has really been instrumental in helping to create our beautiful vegetable garden out back. And we have the stock tank planters on our new playground out front, and she has really been the driving force behind keeping those going. So we thank Flora for her time and wish her the best. Any questions? Thanks to every single individual you mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you, Ben. Uh, is there any public comment? We don't have any members of, pub of the public in person. Anybody online like to speak? All right. Thank you. Moving on to unfinished business. We have to vote policies AA, AA-1, ACA, BGF, and CHCA. We have a motion. A motion. Motion to approve. I'll second. What questions do we have? I, to... I, have, I have a general question. Great. Um, the way these are presented has changed because my recollection before uh, when we were dealing with policies was that the change would be in red or something like that so you could see what was what was and now what will be. Um, obviously, that's not the case in any of this. It should be. It should be. If you guys didn't get it in red, I can get you two in red. It's in black and white. Yeah. It's all black and white. And I mean, the red had. I have a copy of some red. So something was that, you know, it could be something added. It was in red. And if there was something that was leaving, it was like had a, you know, lines to it or something. And so, I'll Jen send it, redo it. Because we, we have it in red. Okay. Because that's, probably, that's, that's, how the, that's how the committee went through it, was it was in red. So I, my assumption is yours was in red. Okay. So um, okay. I'll get that out to you. I'll get it up to you after this so you'll have it for the next meeting. We'll see the changes. Okay. Would, you like, would you like to table this for tonight until we can see the changes clearly? I can think of a way. It, 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 it's not going to take long regardless. And we'll mm -hmm. just yeah. do it so that we got a chance. Because I read through these things and I'm saying, yeah. you know, at a certain point, I got sort of like, hold it, something. Uh -huh. The the ones tonight, I can kind of go through and I can even tell you what the changes are. I don't think, I mean, I think it'd be so, I think most of that's so obvious, so we don't need to. The ones that are we, not significant, there was some just legal language. We could, we could just do them part of the group next meeting. And yeah. If okay. we can send them as part of that package, just okay. all with the, with the red in, then it would be great. I'll make a motion to table this item until our next meeting. Last all in favor? Four zero. Okay, hang on. I got to catch up here. Yep. Okay. Hey, it's Jess and Amanda. Motion from. Jessica seconded by Amanda, and the original motion to approve was um, and seconded from by you and seconded by yeah. her, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, similarly, voting to remove BK, because it's a single policy, do you want to just explain it to us and vote on yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're just removing it, obviously, it just, um, there's no significance to having that policy. There may have been. Mm -hmm. And in all the cases in general, down in the in the whole new sets of policies where they're removing ones, it's just this was we had a subcommittee that worked on these, and they, there was no reason to have that policy. It was the conclusion, right? Correct. So yeah, and um, 
going into those the newer ones the so we grow, we're going through every section and every single policy so um as we go through we're also comparing our policy handbook to the masc policy handbook so they're they went through and then they gave us all the changes and then we're going through looking at what the changes are and then looking at our own policy handbook to, to see which ones if we have policies they do and don't have um so we're adding ones that they have that we don't have so much are as you know, some more, I want to say surprising in the sense of like, we like uh, suspending our policy was something we, I kind of assumed we had. At some point, our, poli our their master copy does not look like ours. So we're getting those up. And then if they have, they don't have it, we have it, we look through to see why and if it's still relevant. There are a few that have, are still on, but there are many that are just, um, are being taken care of by either other policies or they're not saying anything that is necessary to have a policy on, um, such as BK. You know, the committee may maintain membership of national, state, and regional school committees, boards, associations, and may take active part in activities in these groups. You don't need a policy on that. It's just another page in a book where you, you know, at some point, maybe before, you know, the ed reform of 93, was there, was there a reason for it? And I don't know why, but honestly, some of these could go back this far. Um, so, that's why you'll hear other ones where it's like, we're not matching the, their book. We want to get as close to their book as possible, only for ease for us. So when they do changes, right. you know, that kind of thing, as long as it doesn't change what we want for outcomes from our policies, you know, especially something like this, where it's like, let's say this was our, but we wanted this policy. We don't need to rewrite it. It's, it's straightforward. It's, you know, it's, that's what, there are some policies we tweak, you know, that um, we want our own kind of flavor to, but the majority of them are, more and more just the law being translated to policy. Right. <clears throat> no, I think it's great you had a subcommittee go through these things because it's reassuring, you know, that yeah, not only it's not just you saying, yeah, we gotta do this, but it's you and a group of fellow school committee yep. folks that are agreeing that yeah, this is what we need to do. So that's all Megan. Right. Yeah, thank you for that. It's been a while at that afternoon leaving these suckers. Yeah. 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 Hmm, I wonder what James here. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. No problem. No problem. No problem. <laughs> and some of them are so minor that if you right. have the Sorry. red, Sorry. if you had the red, you would have you would have taken it half the time because like the adding of like mm -hmm. maybe if it like a particular group was not. You know, if there's a, you know, make sure we weren't discriminating against a particular group and they added a group by law. We said that's significant enough that it has to vote before the committee because we're talking, you know, we don't just assume you add groups. So you, you know, it's, you have to make a statement when you add groups. Um, so when you look through it, you'll be kind of like, uh, really? <laughs> would you entertain a motion to vote on removing BK? I would. I'd, I'd move that. Any further discussion? All in favor? Four zero. We're removing BK. Um, Darius, for for getting the uh, a revised version of these um, policies to consider. Could we also have them clearly labeled which ones are to be removed? Thanks. Um, all right, moving on. Superintendency agreement. We are voting tonight. I'll make a motion to approve it. And discussion. I'm assuming the experience from your end as far as dealing with this, you know, your situation here was seemed reasonable. I think the um I think we get to try it out, which I think is kind of neat. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it, you know, usually yeah, no, and so I'm, people get seen, yeah. you can see how it would work. Um and I think it maybe it I even said this last night at the uh, Frontiers meeting or the other night, Frontiers meeting, that, you know, it may take a moment longer, but you could spend twice as much if you don't have a, you know, even in, in a smooth transi uh, transition or discussion, um, it was very clear about how it worked. And I don't know, I, I don't think, think it worked. I think it's really admirable that you basically started this whole process to come up with this and got, you know, pushed it all the way through and so on. And now we've got this because, you know, that's not a simple thing. And and I think that, uh, you know, you need to be congratulated for, for getting this something now that uh, 
hopefully only have to use it when we're all in agreement you know and it's simple but if we do run into a case some point down the road when it's not simple they're sure going to be glad they've got a roadmap so thank you um when it's been assuming it gets approved by all five committees um will a copy be put in the town archive i guess so sure <laughs> it would have been helpful if um, the previously existing one had been in the town archive right oh that's yeah for the regional agreement you're saying yeah it's a good idea. I didn't think about that. I'll do it. Great. Um, got two more like little detail questions that are just for my understanding going forward. Um, so this this agreement says unapproved minutes from the subcommittee of chairs will get distributed to all school committees prior to being approved by that subcommittee. So if the subcommittee clerk sends unapproved minutes out to all the school committees, as this says, do questions get directed to your own school committee chair or to the person who wrote the minutes? Or do we figure that out later? I or suppose it would go to the person who, the first time, the first round of questions would be the person who wrote the minutes to make sure it's not a, okay. an issue of, depending on what the question is. Mm -hmm. And then um, I suppose it would be then brought to everyone. It wouldn't just be that chair because it's the bodies and minutes, not just the person who represents that body's minutes. Yeah. So I think it would go to the with the note takers and then okay. would be how I would guess that. I, I, okay. It, it just, yeah, sure. I've got no sure. yep. prior reference for And then also it sounds, just want to confirm my understanding of this uh, policy is that there could never be an emergency meeting of the, of the subcommittee. Because it says that there's no exception for an emergency meeting. It says they must all subcommittee meetings must be posted at least 48 hours in advance. Is there a reason that there's no emergency clause? Can think of it. Um, oh, that's run by Russ. I'm okay with approving it without that. Okay. It does say we're going to revise it every two years. Yeah. And it might be that the, I'm wondering that like our own rules for school committees, that the rule is that you have to post 48 hours in advance. I mean, there is an emergency clause and it has to fit the law standard of what it constitutes an emergency. So, yeah. Okay. I'm trying to think what would constitute an emergency and that kind of thing. In that case, you would do it and then be in trouble for not following your policy. <laughs> you know what I mean? It'd be such an emergency if you had to have a meeting that to discuss a position of somebody without doing 48 hours notice, there would have to be something really bad going on. Yeah. Or, <laughs> or, 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 or really, really positive. Like you had to get the nomination for the superintendent of the year in by Friday. <laughs> We got a million dollar um, grant, but we have to approve it within 24 hours. Right. <laughs> I'll ask, I'll ask. Okay. Um, any other discussion? Uh, how many of the committees have approved this so far? It's the January agenda and your meeting number two. Your meeting number so two. Frontiers okay. and Owens at the Senate. I'm done. So do the rest of the committees have meetings next week? Two weeks, next two weeks. We have next two, two weeks. We have two next week and one the following week. And then we're likely to schedule the annual subcommittee meeting. It says there's an annual meeting of the subcommittee. We really okay. had it. Oh, yeah. oh, for the chairs, you're saying? For the chairs. Um, yeah, I guess Here's what the policy says. Right. Yep. I've got a bunch of things I would like to discuss. <laughs> yeah. You know, it might be uh, timing wise, it may also be. Um, the administration has ideas that it wants to do for the joint meeting, and it might be to do a meeting of that and talk a little bit about how we set that up because you have a joint meeting in April. Okay. I don't have to push it off. I'm just saying that we've been talking about some ideas about long term strategic planning for the district and how to approach that. I'm not sure if it should, I mean, it should be a chair is talking about it. It could be part, it should be part of that group. I don't know. All right. We'll talk. All right. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Any further discussion? We have a motion to approve the superintendency agreement. All in favor? Aye. Yes, 4-0.
Great, moving on to new business, the equity plan. New equity plan. So I'm putting, it was sent out to everybody, but I'm also putting it on the screen. So um, we've created the equity plan, where my notes here. Um, and to kind of talk about how it all kind of fits together, um, I think it's best the the map, or I guess the um, we'll call this the different plans within our district. I wanted to share this kind of slide, or you've seen it on your thing as well. But when we're talking about how the equity plan and how it works and how it fits in with all of our other planning, this really when we put this kind of together, it helped me out a great deal. As I joked the other night, I'll, just like the just like the plan you just approved, when you have it spelled out with how it kind of flows. Um, it makes it a lot more clear. Um, but because we always talk about these different plans, we have a professional development plan, assessment plan, curriculum plan, and now we have an equity plan. And in the equity plan, when we're talking about things, we're talking, we're discussing those other plans and about how um, equity work falls into those plans before going into our strategic plan. And in the in the blue plans, those are pretty static. I'm not saying they can't change, but you're not changing those year to year. So again, the, the curriculum plan, the professional development plan, the assessment plan, and equity plan, it's like, those are like how we are doing our planning, okay? And then those feed into our strategic plan, which has goals. Um, it is due next year to be updated um, in usually three to five years. And then after that, we have our, what you would call your annual plans, which is your PD plan, your school improvement plans, and the equity action steps. Um, and that is, that's our brand new thing, the equity action step. So that we're going to see that evolve as we start to use it. But that was that colorful graph where we showed at all the list of all the different things, the recommendations, and then some um, that could actually see outcomes and you could see for the years out. So that was the, that's the equity action plan. So I kind of wanted to just explain that like there, because it does get confusing when you start talking about all these different plans and what do they mean and so forth. Okay. Um, and I do have Laura here, who graciously said, um, to come join us on and be able to chip in because she is the one of the main architects behind this. Her and Sarah did the, the lion's share of the work. Um, and so if you guys do have questions, I am going to defer to her. But with so within their equity plan, you know, um, we did talk about the different things that make it up, um, basically about the design requirements, delivery and consistency of equity work in our district how we're gonna look at data and program evaluation through the equity lens, um, how we're gonna monitor our equity plan, and then communication for supports and consistency. So that's kind of the breakdown of um, the equity plan. Um, let me sure kind of going through. So um, and I'm not gonna read it to you kind of deal. Um, the, overall, that's the, the focus of it, is it brings structure to the work that we're already doing. Kind of, we're kind of building it backwards, um, and I really do want to thank Laura and Sarah. They do. There's not we're on the front curve of this in the sense that there was not a lot of exemplars to pull from. Um, we really kind of uh, are building this kind of idea, of, not the idea from scratch. They, you know, they recommended a plan, and we said you have an exemplar, and they really didn't have an exemplar to match this. So I'm excited that we're kind of on the cutting edge of making this a plan um, to drive. The idea of these things is it drives when the people in the room change, right? The same thing as everything else that a lot of the planning is that, you know, what makes um, the equity work ongoing and how do you keep it in all that you do? So that's for it. Questions? So have the equity audit folks looked at this draft and given any feedback on it? No. They said they So they, um, <laughs> have, we haven't run it by Jim or anything else, have we? No. No, we haven't run the content of the text by them, but um, we did consult with them a little bit on the structure of it because we made an outline and it it is a parallel to the outline for the curriculum management plan, the professional development plan, and the assessment management plan so that there's coherence, like it begins with a vision and then it talks about um, the the, you know, the way we'll monitor it, the way we'll deliver it, the, the different aspects of it, so that all of those, like whether it's the curriculum or PD or equity. And so those those were vetted, um, but we haven't seen the final the final draft that we have now. Is this document meant to 
supplement or replace the equity foundation statement? I think this this is like a roadmap. <clears throat> I think the foundation tell, statement tells you the story of the journey you're taking, and this is the roadmap to make sure you're getting to where you want to go with the what, what stops you have to do along the way. Oh, what an analogy to come off right up to me like that. <laughs> um, that's kind of my kind of thought. Laura, would you agree, disagree? Yeah, it's not the same thing because that was that was an artifact of the anti-racism and equity committee on behalf mm -hmm. of the district mm -hmm. and the district approved it. And so that is a standing document. And I think that it belongs in the in the way things are organized. I think that that belongs in um, I'm looking for the section where that lives. I think that that belongs in our community engagement section because it um, that details like the plan is that the district maintains structural support for the anti-racism and equity committee, the voluntary group of stakeholders, including staff, admin, alumni, um, that and caregivers that meet quarterly. And um, I think that, that is part of maintaining is our shared vision statement, the district approved shared vision. It really is an artifact of that collaboration. So that foundation statement is going to remain in public facing. It'll stay on the website mm -hmm. yes. next to this. Great. Yes. We do have a question. Sarah and I have a question. So when I say we, I just mean Sarah and I. Yeah. We um, think that it could be edited, you know, mm -hmm. like, and so we are not sure what the process would be for making it just a, a little cleaner, mm -hmm. easier to read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I guess that might take a vote. I'm not really clear on where it lives in terms of being voted on by school committees or whatnot, but that is on our minds is, so if you want to make this, you know, a one page, if we want to try to just make it like, not lose anything about what went into it, but make it easier to access for everybody, then we would like to have a nice access, accessible page. Yeah, sounds good. I, I was one of the early authors on that, oh, yeah, and yeah, I yeah. would support. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it. I'm I'm just curious about something. That is that uh, uh, it seems to me that in Sunderland we also have a school council for this. Mm -hmm. Same we have a school council and school committee, and it's the school council. For example, that deals with the annual school improvement plan, that it seems to me much of this work is way more familiar to that body than to this body. Granted, mm -hmm. you've been on sitting on both. Um, and which to me is just fine, but I'm wondering if, you know, this sort of discussion should be something that is, also, you know, Perhaps even more so carried on with the school council rather than with this group. Because I know that they, you know, there was reactions from what you and Joe were saying when we went over to the presentation there and so on, that you guys were way more aware of what was going on in Sunderland than we had been exposed to just as part of our com committee business. I mean, you know, the others are parents here and so on, and so they know about them. Personally, I was like, oh, there's a lot of stuff there that's going on at school council. So on and so I'm wondering if you're if, if a similar discussion really takes place at school council where they may have certainly more invested on an ongoing basis. The school council right now is focused in on a specific piece of this of gathering sort of surveying, but using street data, um, sort of taking the temperature of the community to figure out what else could be worked on. Um, and it's going to, that's going to be very, very time consuming for us to do. So I'm not sure we can actually fit this in, in this school year. But it does, it does naturally go there. So the school council yeah. is supposed to be the one that's approved the school improvement plans from suggestion from the principal. And so the principal is going to get those suggestions from the strategic plan that's built by the administrative team. You know, it's, it's, it's technically it comes from my office and vision, but it's really an administrative team, um, which is supposed to be fed by the equity plan. So it's going to come down that stream. And then so Ben should be going from the school council and saying, OK, here's our, you know, as you remember how he sets it up, there are the different areas of working on. And under equity, you know, right now he would be saying, you know, we have, you know we're rolling out the new curriculum. 
um, the new reading curriculum, which is really is really is, uh, has a lot of emphasis in that area, and you know these different areas, so that they do have a hand in that. And then they might be saying, what other community outreach projects, which they probably get their hands dirty with, um, being involved with, rather than just kind of stamping things through or proving things. And that's kind of sounds like we're doing something now, trying to get feedback from the community on certain things. So it that's kind of the streamline where it does exist. The same thing with where school committee gets involved is that the strategic plan is gonna, it gets run by a school committee and so does the school improvement plan after it's been through them. So it comes back around, you won't know the intimate details of it. And depending on, of, you know, like, you know, like tonight, like when we start talking about the budget, that's, you're gonna walk away thinking a lot about budget. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you have other priorities sometimes, but um, it, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to, you guys have a lot, as a school committee, a lot you oversee at all. Right, right. So but, but in this particular area, it is really something where the school council is carrying the ball on it, strikes me, and that therefore uh, should make sure that they, you know, whatever conversation that the administration feels like it needs to have with Sunderland, mm, okay. that that conversation in this area be directed directly to the school council and not somehow through our liaison person. Yeah, I mean, it just seems to me somehow that there's, there needs to be direct talking. And, you know, maybe that means you go into a school council meeting instead of, you know, or in addition to a school committee meeting or something like that on this stuff, because, um, you know, that's where things are happening. That's where changes are being made. And I'm not just trying to get out of it, okay? But it's like, you know, I feel, I feel like totally unprepared to talk about, you know, things going on in this because we haven't been dealing with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just tossing it out. I actually think that one of the benefits of having just this plan, which is static, it just says all of the places where equity shows up in our systems, it shows up in hiring, it shows up in assessments, it shows up in curriculum selection, it shows up in professional development, it shows up in, and by outlining all of the places where we need to take responsibility for thinking through an equity lens, in addition to all the other lens, like rigorous um, academics and the budget, like we have so many lenses to think through and by adding this as an official lens, I think it just makes it, it kind of paves the sidewalk so that people can bring up issues related to um, an equity experience as easily as they bring up an issue related to uh, an academic experience or a budget experience. If we just, by making this formal plan, I think some things won't change. It just, I hope that it changes the district by making it just more normal to talk about and easier if nobody feels like they're blazing the trail like the district has paved the path so anybody can walk on it and if that's what's on your mind then you know that there's lots of places to go i hope <clears throat> just because it's hard to be a trailblazer talking about something that is it hasn't always been prioritized but once we say this is a priority i hope that that's what it does May I offer one piece of feedback? Yeah. Uh, so school council has just finished reading the book Street Data. Oh, I know that book. You do know that yeah, book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so as I read through this equity plan, just the one thing that felt to me like it was missing was um, sort of a focus on any individual voices. It talked about yeah. you know, surveys yeah. and having aggregate data, but what about when you have the one outlier who's really inequitably impacted somehow? Yeah, yeah. How, how are those marginalized voices yeah. going to come to the center and the focus? I, I wish that there was a preference to that, but to to really, um, you know, say, say that the marginalized voices need to be, you know, supported, heard, responded to yeah. meaningfully. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right, thank you for all of your work on that. It's a, it's a great document. Uh, moving on to, this is first reading of new policies. Do we want to read all of the letters? We've got a slew of new policies that we'll vote on next time. Correct. We've kind of already discussed this process. 
Um, Anybody have questions about these particular policies? Do we need to say anything else about them? I mean, I have cliff notes on what each one is. I kind of ran through them the other night. I don't know if it's helpful or not. So it's up to you if you want me to do it. I'm or... <laughs> What's that? I have no preference. Okay. My, you know, my sense on reading through them was that there was nothing that was a big deal. Right. <laughs> yeah, they they are. You know, there weren't anything that was, <laughs> uh, there was only one question. Anyway, basically, they are not like, you know, some way in which we're changing our operations or solving some problem or, you know, possibly creating some other. They were all so sort of mundane. Right. And I can get, you know, it, and it was like, oh, God, how many of these things do they I have? I could do it. I could do it in two minutes and then you'll, you'll, you'll have an idea of what each one is. Okay. Right. I'll do How about I do that? Because I, I did prep it, so I never use it. Um, EEAEC is student conduct on buses. It is also our JICC and should be cross reference. So we already have the policy, but we don't have it as it's titled as EEAEC. It's under G J I C C. All right. So it's just being placed in two places. EEAG is transportation and private vehicles. There's updated language around quarry checks to make sure that um, the, the drivers, uh, of volunteers and such, have been quarry checked. DGI is staff participation in political activities. It's just a, it, um, there's just clear language around that during the workday, staff members may not be um, uh, participating in political activities outside the workday, they certainly can. GCA, um, professional staff positions, is a new policy. It, describe, it um, talks about having job descriptions and new positions approved by school committee. GCK is professional staff assignments and transfer. Um, this is a new one for us that probably should be in there, but basically talks that the principal has the authority, if nothing changes in practice, has the authority to assign what positions um, people are doing in the building. GDB, um, support staff contracts and compensation plans. This is a new policy. Um, it is for people who are not on a collective bargaining contract um, that you know we have to basically just gives a general policy about that they have to be on salary schedules and pay time and a half and that kind of thing. Um, uh, negotiation legal status um, for HB, um, it just basically they, they said you should have that page as a legal, that negotiation is a legal um, process. JF, um, school admissions, um, follows our current practice. We just haven't had a policy regarding how kindergarten admissions works. School choice, is JFBB and JFBB one means frontier. Um, basically, they're, they are different because the dates are slightly different, but it gives an, a range of when the school has to make the decisions by um, if they're going to be a school choice school. So those are the new policies. Um, the removing policies, um, administrative report, not part of the master MASC and is not needed. Enrollment projections is not part of the master MASC and is not needed. Um, both of them, as you can read through, you can ask for those, you can ask for those reports. We haven't been giving five-year enrollment averages and that kind of thing, basically because there's no, when we had, when we parted, we were part of NESDIC, the information was always off and wasn't helpful anyways. <laughs> GA is personnel policies and policy goals. It's not part of the MASAC, but I also want to say that we did our own goals around equity work. So we created our own policy to talk about, um, personnel goals. Um, GCCD, domestic violence leave policy, um, is, has been legally changed and no longer recommended as MASA, MASC policy. Um, GDQD, suspension dismissal of support staff members, um, it can be found in the collective bargaining agreement and is also not an MASC policy. Retirement, they're all, I probably just say they're not, they're all, or none of them are MASC policies that we're seeing here. Retirement of professional staff members was almost comical. We have to let them retire. <laughs> Retirement of support staff members, basically you have to let support staff members retire. Um, again, both of them not needed. Negotiations, um, it's not needed. It's full of filler language and doesn't really say anything. JBA, student to student harassment, can now be found under C, 
I'll just read them. Sexual harassment, bullying prevention, harassment of students, and non-discrimination, including harassment and retaliation policies. JHBBA um, public absence notification program policy is not part of MASC, and it can be found, our tennis policies are found in our handbooks. Religious holidays can be found under JH, and it's not part of the master. It, it talks about religious holidays under um, other JH, which is, I don't, I don't know where the title, but it's uh, uh, absence and time off. And then corporal punishment, if I have to explain, <laughs> you don't need to have that in there. It's against law. Thank going, you. Going back to, it's not too late to go, oh no, in this group here, JFBD and JFBD1, which are about school choice. Yep. Okay. Um, they both reference whether well, the <laughs> FBB relates to the elementary schools. Yep. And it says that uh, by June 1st of every year, a public hearing will be held to review participation in the school choice program. So basically, your um, public, it's on the agenda of the school committee is your public hearing. You're having a discussion about that, and the public can give comment, anything that's on the agenda. And that's considered as sufficient. We don't have to open a special hearing and close a special hearing nope. or anything like that. No. Nope. Okay. Nope. So you publicly made a public decision on whether or not you'll be a school choice school. And it, we do a way earlier than this, so it's by, so if there was any reason, like, let's say this is a year where, like, actually, when we talk about it, this could be a year where we, we're not sure if we're going to accept school choice. We may have to wait till the end of the budget, the closer. It gives a deadline where eventually you have to let families know. Um, we've been a lot earlier than that, and we'll, you know, actually, it's probably next month, I think, we're going to probably vote on whether or not we'll be a school choice school. Because um, we have to let families know because they want to get in there for it. And then, they want to be in the queue. And then JFBB1 applies to the regional school. Yep. And it says it's policy not to admit school choice. Or has that been, is that supposed to be in red and therefore that comes out? Yeah, that's out? what I thought too. Yeah. Mm. Right there in the, in the first line. Is this why this change? No, it's an error. Thank you. That's supposed to be probably red to remove. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, because you say that's probably in okay. red. Yep. It's not bold. <laughs> I don't know how. Yeah, I don't know how that happened though. All right, I'll get that fixed. Okay. And that doesn't apply to us. So. Yeah, but still, you guys vote them all. We so have, you know, yeah, we're we voting on, on it. Why are we voting on something that's a regional policy? Oh, because we all share a handbook. We share that. We share that. The policy handbook has both, and so we okay. try for consistency. They also vote on your one. That's fine. Technically, yeah. if it came push came to sub, you would you would say no. It's not, we don't want to vote on that. It's a regional policy. It doesn't. I guess you could be truthful. Your pol your vote doesn't matter on that because it doesn't. <laughs> you don't have the authority to <laughs> apply it. Um, but anyway, school choice to take Thank you. It was a good catch. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right, first reading complete. Moving on to the budget. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on and that way I can control it. Scrolling back. There's no control issues, was there? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so a couple of things first before we get started is I, I did send out a new packet and I printed slide decks. I don't know if anyone wants you can take it. If not, I'll take them back. But some people like paper and some people don't. Um, so <clears throat> there are some definite pros and cons and some easier decisions and harder decisions that we're going to have to make as part of the dis this discussion. That's normal. Right, we talk about hard things every time when we get through the budget, and some of it's going to be easy, and some of it's going to be more challenging. Uh, this is the first draft, so as I said in my email to you, you don't have all of the typical data that you have. There's not a line by line budget presented yet. Part of that reasoning is because we need to make some decisions on where the budget is going, and I didn't want to give you three different versions of pages of line by line items. So um, there's more materials as we go through this process, February and especially into March, when we have select board 
present with us and then for our own public hearing. So there's more of that coming. And to start us off, we're going to recap on FY24. Just as a quick reminder, even though we're looking at those budget numbers monthly, I think it's good for us to reflect back and see where things were last year. So our adopted budget came in at 6.63%. Uh, that covered uh, wage obligations for increases uh, for all staff across the board, uh, union and non-union. And then we had adjustments of 34000 based on prior year actuals for existing expenses. Uh, we had a revolving fund adjustment as our revolving funds couldn't continue to carry the same weight that they had in prior years. We were seeing revenues coming down and expenses not changing. Uh, and we did add one new position, which was a school adjustment counselor. Uh, the original budget was higher by $100,000, so we would have been, you know, well into 8 plus percent, um, but we made the decision to fund $100,000 of that by ESSER, which brought us down to the 6.63. That's what went to town meeting, and that's what was adopted. So for fiscal year 25, uh, we haven't talked about timeline at all, so I thought that I would give us all a little refresher here. I'm not going to go through each of these, but it is a, a four meeting process as it stands right now. All of the meetings, I believe, are all at 6 o'clock. I didn't put the times on here, but I'm pretty sure that Sunderlands are all at 6 p.m. Um, so we have... We're going to hear this story multiple times. Things may change as we go through. We really want to be uh, more concrete in February so that going into that public hearing in March, we have a more realistic number. And then we will have the second meeting to vote on the budget in late March. And I put April 26 in parentheses because I think that's the town meeting date, but it's not on their website yet. But it it's is, the yeah. last Friday last in Friday. April, right? So I was pretty sure that that's where we were going to end Quick refresher on how the budget is developed. Uh, so the goal of the district during budget development is to plan a needs-based, student-centered, fiscally responsible budget for the upcoming school year. Uh, we take input from all of our stakeholders. Uh, ben has conversations with staff at the school-based level. We're having administrative conversations, and that trickles down to any administrator, special education, facilities, curriculum, making sure that we have all the I's dotted and the T's crossed when we're submitting uh, the first drafts of the new budget. And then we try to have a balanced approach. You know, we don't have a lot of extra money in our planning, but we do want to consider new needs and initiatives as we go through the process, at least initially, so that you all know things that uh, we as administration think that the school needs that we may not have. We do include those in here. Um, primarily, we are looking at a level service budget, but it's important to note that level service does not mean level funding. There is always an increase when we're looking at level services, if for nothing else but salaries and wages. Uh, so we have contractual obligations that cause that level service to increase for existing staff based on the two union contracts and then our uh, support staff and other school based and then central office staff to receive annual increases as well. And then there's always inflation and things like that that factor into the level service budget. I wanted to give you some information on expenses. This is something that we don't talk in a great detail about, but when you look at the monthly reports, you do see these function codes, which this is set by DESE. This is not something that the school district sets up. We have to report on that at the end of the year based on function code. Um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of description of how they break things down. So there's district administration, instruction, pupil services, uh, plant, physical plant and operations, benefits and fixed charges, there are other codes between 6,000 and 9,000, but we typically don't use them here at this level. They have a lot to do with um, debt service, you know, buying land, those kind of things that we really don't get into a whole lot here, buying vehicles, things like that. Um, so I didn't even include them on here for you because they're not even one of our expense codes. And then finally, in that 9,000 category, those are expenses related to out-of-district placement. So this will come more into play when you see the line-by-line -line budget. Hopefully, this description gives you a little bit more understanding of how things are categorized and why they're categorized the way that they are. Um, but when we talk about these generally and looking at our budget on the next page of the presentation, um, it correlates with our budget drivers. So you can see here in green uh, instruction, which is direct instruction to the student population. So anything related to 
curriculum, teaching staff, um, including IAs, um, materials, supplies, technology, pretty much anything that it takes to educate our students falls under those instructional categories in the Function Code 2000 range. That is about um, three quarters of our budget. So you can see that a good chunk of our funds are going directly back to student teaching. Um, and then the other categories there that we just talked about, pupil services. So at the elementary school, uh, that really accounts for transportation costs and school lunch. Those are the two big ones under pupil services and um, uh, health services. So the nursing office. Uh, supplies and materials and staffing in that category. Operations and maintenance is the second largest component for us. Uh, that includes utilities, buildings, repairs, custodial lines, uh, facility staff and central office, things along those lines. Uh, district administration primarily refers to central office staff and whatever falls under the school committee function code. So if school committee was receiving stipends or a salary, um, that would fall under that line. Your expenses for trips when you go to the conference, um, supplies and materials, if there's you know any budget books or anything that we're printing for you all falls under that line. Benefits and fixed charges, there's not a lot related to school budget under benefits and fixed charges, primarily because the town handles benefits for the staff. But some examples of things that fall under this line are separation costs for retirement if we have to pay those out based on the contract. Uh, central office benefits, um, insurance falls under here. So if we pay liability insurance, if the town bills us back <laughs> for that, that stuff falls under that category. And then out of district placement typically is a large portion of the total budget. But when we're looking at this, we're just looking at general fund. We're not looking at any of our revolving funds. So we do have out of district placement here, but this slice of the pie is small. Um, which could be because we're using revolving funds to supplement or we don't have a significant number of out-of-district placements. Uh, so primary budget drivers are salaries and wages, facilities and operations, transportation and special education costs. And that is not just district-wide, not just Western Mass. This is theme across the state, if not across the country. And salaries and wages of that instructional um, related expenditures probably three quarters of that piece of the pie is just wages to our faculty and staff that are teaching students. All right, so now that you have some info and some history, let's look at what we're actually talking about for first draft of the budget. <laughs> so looking at level services, which takes existing staffing and programs, as I said earlier, and that's our starting point. So the first thing that we do is look at wage increases, uh, across the board. So contractual for unit A and unit C, school-based staff and central office. Uh, we take into consideration any attrition. So if we know we have somebody resigning or retiring, we make adjustments that could go up or down. Uh, we may have a brand new teacher that you know didn't have their master's degree yet and they came in at a bachelor's, but we anticipate that when we hire someone new, we are gonna hire someone with a master's. So that's where you could see the increase. There's also benefits where we know we have a master teacher who's at the you know highest column and highest step and they're retiring and we know we're probably gonna replace them with someone who maybe has middle of the road experience. So we see savings there. So that's being captured in this level service budget. That's one of the first things that we start to look at. And our wage increase for Sunderland for next year is anticipated to be significantly lower than it has been in prior years. Um, just as a reminder, also COLA next year is 2% uh, for IAs and for teachers. And then the step increases on the teacher salary schedule average about 3.19%. Um, and then for IAs, it it varies depending on the step. It's not as consistent as the teacher stepping, but it is generally around another 3% on top of that if they're stepping. Um, so in regards to teachers for next year or anyone on the unit A contract, which is not just classroom grade level teachers, it includes anyone that's on a, you know, the nurse, the school psychologist, OT, PT, all of those pieces. So anyone that falls under the unit A contract, a couple of things to note. Uh, we do have 
a few teachers who are moving to step 14, which means that we're seeing some more significant increases for them because they will sit at 14 until they hit that longevity bump, um, which is not for several years out. And then on the positive side, uh, we do have uh, two retirements that we're capturing in this wage uh, increase for next year, one of which uh, we are not replacing. Um, and I will let Ben speak to that a little bit uh, before we move on in the presentation. But then the other one is, um, as I said, a master teacher who we anticipate with the new hire coming in at a lower step. So this increase would probably be at a minimum 75 to 80,000 more if we weren't seeing that attrition next year. So I think that that's important for us to think about as we talk about the direction of the budget and what that would mean. You know, another 70,000 is 2%. So that's uh, a pretty significant number. Ben, do you want to talk about that one position before I keep going? To that yeah, we discussed boss? this in June <laughs> last year where we had a staff member out on maternity leave and um, the individual who was going to be retiring at the end of this year was going to fill in as the classroom teacher from August to the end of December and then from January was going to fill that interventionist role because that staff member was going to be coming back. Um, that staff member ended up is gone the entire year on maternity leave. So um, they're just um, the retiree is um, filling in as a the first grade teacher until the end of the year. Okay. So that interventionist role, just because it was a really unique circumstance and in a you know a normal budget year, we wouldn't necessarily have added that position. So that's what it refers to as the, the unit A attrition. We're just not filling that interventionist role. If that makes sense. Um, I'm not sure I get it, but maybe it's better explained, you know, not in front of a camera, so you know, just I want to make sure I really understand it. You know, what what is it? The interventionist role was, I thought we had a new position that was in the interventionist role. The new position that is the school adjustment counselor. Oh, a different thing. Right. Gotcha. And we were going to be up a classroom teacher. Right. Um, so instead discussion. of, right, we were up a classroom teacher. So instead of cutting a position, right. we chose to fill, um, fill a maternity leave with that extra classroom teacher. Right. And then they were going to serve as an interventionist for the remainder of the year with the plan at retirement to take that off the budget. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to everyone? Mm -hmm. So currently that person is filling a classroom teacher role. So the interventionist idea never happened. So no. with eliminating this position, we're not losing services to students or anything like that. I wanna make sure that that's clear for everybody. Does that help, Peter? Maybe. Sorry. <laughs> <I'm> getting old. <laughs> it's complicated, though, for sure. Okay. Um, so I, I'm not going to read all of these amounts out to you as to what Unit C school based staff and central office is. I will make a comment about central office. This is significantly lower than you would see in a normal year, primarily because we're capturing the savings of the nurse leader position, because the nurse leader position was full time. We didn't make the change until after budget had been approved last year. So now we're seeing the savings of the nurse leader position. And that is a central office share position. So everyone district wide is going to see savings from that role this year. So that would be much higher for central office as well. So non-wage increases to go through that quickly because there's not a lot to talk about here. Uh, we do have employee separation costs. So that's a retirement. A contractual obligation that we're going to have to pay out this year that's 55,000 is the rough estimate and then I always go through line by line and look at a multi-year comparison of actuals for anything that's not wages so we are going to have a couple of increases next year our accounting software line which is the central office accounting system we have made some upgrades to that we're seeing multiple years now of that line being over um, there is an adjustment in here for the transportation line because our contract is up for renewal. We're just putting that out for bid. 
uh, this month that's going to go pu get publicized Monday for the regular transportation, not special ed transportation. So I put in a small amount there that could go up. We don't know what's going to happen when the bid comes in. We could get one bid, <laughs> which is, I think, what happened last time where we got yeah. three bids and it mm -hmm. becomes more competitive. So there may be more to come about that. But right now there is a buffer. And then a couple of other lines that are consistently over year to year, which is primarily due to inflation, are related to utilities. Our trash keeps going up, you know, so we're trying to adjust for some of those things. Phone charges, the town is back billing us for some of the phone lines that they get billed from Verizon for. So I made some adjustments there. So that's $11,000. And then two other big adjustments contributing to the 6.34% level service budget increase are grant adjustments and revolving fund adjustments. So in the current year, in the recap, I mentioned this, we paid $100,000 of expenses from this year on ESSER. You're not seeing the true $100,000 reflection here because part of that was the teacher salary. So rather than putting that on budget, we have a teacher retiring. So we're not seeing as much of an increase in the budget because of that change. The other adjustment, this is year two of this happening where our revolving funds, and as we go through and we talk about the revolving fund balances, you're gonna see expenses are exceeding revenue. This is not, shouldn't be new conversation. It would probably be new for you, <laughs> but nobody else. Um, repeat here that our revenues are coming down, our expenses are staying the same, they're not dropping at the same amount. So. The only thing that we can do is find another funding source. So we start by putting those onto budget and then see if we have other options. Yeah. So that is the total of the $212,000 increase as our starting point that you're seeing here. From there, we look at new requests and initiatives. So that's where our stakeholders come into play. Uh, ben has his conversations. I talk to other administrators and we see what the needs are. So the ask I think here is minimal and reasonable. You know, 16,000 is probably roughly half a percent. Um, and these, while they're new requests and initiatives, they're more along the lines of right-siding the budget. Um, field trips, we are seeing that more and more families and students need support with scholarships so that they can continue to participate in field trips. And part of that cost is also um, transportation busing is going up district wide and that includes for our trips so there's an increase there um, curriculum consumables we have this amazing new curriculum that you all have heard about multiple times now it comes with a cost because we have new consumables we did look at okay what were we purchasing previously for this product and what is the new product that we need and made adjustments so it's not a hundred percent um all just a an increase to the budget because we swapped some things out, but we are seeing some new needs for consumables there. And then the next three um, are recommendations from Ben to increase primarily based on inflation. Um, not that we've been over in these lines necessarily, although building, general buildings repairs, you know we always need more money there, but medical supplies and materials is based on needs in the building, so is general supplies and the cost of everything is so. Um, not a significant ask here, you know, no new staffing, anything along those lines. It's really a minor amount. A very silly graphic. <laughs> <laughs> when it's in the PowerPoint, the money is actually <laughs> moving. <laughs> I love it. Um, <laughs> all right. So before we keep talking about next steps with the budget, because uh, from an administrative perspective, 6.83 is high, especially when we came off of a year that felt high last year at 6.63. So, you know, it's hard to keep going back to the town and asking for hundreds of thousands of dollars. So before we continue the conversation of what options we have to bring the budget down to something that might be more palatable to the town, we want to have a conversation about enrollment. Um, and I think you're going to hear some of the same themes here. And Darius and Ben, please jump in um, and help me out as part of this conversation goes on. But our enrollment is staying relatively steady. It's declining slightly. We're currently at 184 and we're projecting right now to be between 166 and 170 next year. So it's a slight decline. But if you look back over the last three years, it's generally the range that we've been in. Primarily the pre-K and the K classes are the ones that fluctuate those numbers. So 
pre-K this year ended up being at 28 students. If you look back at last budget year cycle, the projection was similar to this, where we're thinking maybe we'll have two, two smaller classes. So that's really where the extra students come in as we go through you know, the next six months leading up to the next school year. Um, but as you can see, our class sizes are very small. And we also had this conversation last year. We actually talked about reducing a teacher last year. This goes along with part of what Ben just talked about, that we ended up using um, some staff creatively rather than dropping a staff member. But we're really at a point where we feel like we need to continue that conversation and reconsider reducing staffing um, in the new year to help reduce the budget. A um, couple of things that I wanted to mention is that school choice, based on these numbers, is about 20% of our population. Um, as we tighten up class sizes, the opportunity to grow school choice diminishes, which means it's less revenue potential for us. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, we have 30.55 FTEs on the Unit A contract and 21 FTEs on the unit C contract. So those are just things, info for you to consider as you look at total number of students. And the unit C again? 30.55 um, teachers for unit A. And then 21 unit C. Thanks. Anything that you want to add about enrollment before we keep going? I think we'll, make, we'll end up coming back to it. Um, but there is the as you're looking at some of these numbers, some of the other conversations we're going to have is whether or not we end up freezing school choice and not accepting more school choice so that because we're in this weird position where if you have a class size of, let's looking at the first grade class, you have a class size of 18. Well, you don't want to have more. You could you could add more school choice, but then you could also have more residents come in. And then all of a sudden you start getting a number. You know, we want to see our classes, you know, ideally between, you know, the 18 range, you know, um, that's probably the, the kind of the sweet spot, you know, you can go up to, I mean, we haven't seen classes of that size in this building in a while, but, you know, going up to, you know, 18 to 22 is an acceptable range and technically you know, even bigger, but um, I think that's where most people would say it's depending on the sports you have. Um, so understanding that, you know, if we, have to, if we, if we go to one section, we have to lock school choice, or if we don't go to one section, we may have to lock school choice because then all of a sudden we get to where we have, you know, maybe what you can see in like this current next year, sixth grade, we have 12 and 13. You know what I mean? It, it's almost too big. It's right on that, it's right on that line, you know. Um, it's probably not a good example of that one. There's not a good example within this one because many of these classes, it's classes of 24 could exist. Um, a single class. A single class of 24. And, and just, uh, these are based off of which enrollment? October 1st. October 1st. Yeah, so, so there may be changes. Yeah, that we have, have fluctuated, fluctuated in the upper direction um, for a few of these grade levels. So, but it's still, it's still borderline. And then, you know, the, the kindergarten piece where it lists 19 right there, um, about half of those are known students. So either school choice families um, that have siblings in the upper grades or are in our current preschool. Um, the other half on the town census. So we don't necessarily have our pulse on, on them at this point. Uh, the registration packets did just go out or become available. Um, so we don't have all that information yet. Um, and I also just want to know, in case this is new info to anyone, but the reason we use October 1st numbers is because those are the numbers that the state uses to build the Chapter 70 funding, um, which is the state aid that we receive. So we always look at those. You know, obviously, there's a lot of changes between October 1st and the end of the school year, but um, that's why we look at that number in case anyone was wondering about that. Any enrollment questions before you keep going? Has there been historically a year that has been a big surprise mm -hmm. where you look at the numbers of October 1, you plan it, and then all of a sudden, boom, it's doubled because of, or not, maybe not, that's not, a little, not maybe double. a quarter, you know, 25% more it, or more. Not to in. need to create an additional section. So there was one year where we left first grade with 31 students and nine new students moved in just over the summer 
alone. Um, there was another year um, where the, the school year had already started in sixth grade, and we went from low to mid 20s and pushed that number to 30. Um, so we didn't create two classes. Um, it was a try and year for the sixth grade team, and that's off to them. But again, we haven't had an, an instance where we've gone from one after the budget cycle to having to meet over the summer while, while mm -hmm. there's a ton of kids right now. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? I'm sure I understand correctly here. The number of sections here shows this is projected for FY25, and that's what your budget is based on. Based on current staff already dropping one section. Well, it's not technically dropping a section with the way that things are structured. Well, I'm just saying from from a from a point in the past, in the recent past, okay, where we had it was like two, three years ago we went to, we had two sections in all grades. Okay. We dropped one two, three years ago, something like that. And then in the current time frame, however it's actually playing out, we're ending up dropping another. Okay, and that's built into the budget so that when you are considering, you know, reducing one more section, you're basically, that would make three grades where there would be only one section. Correct. That's correct. I just want to make sure I understand that. Yeah. Okay. You have that right. So the, the one where we reduce the one through this convoluted process that's sort of been going on now or just recently or just to come um you know that's a done deal that's not going back and reconsidering that one yeah. all right so you're correct it would be probably we could probably be clearer to say that we are looking at well not yet because we'll, we'll get to the next page but this next second position it would be two positions that are actually cut from the fte that's correct. And so yeah, that's a good way of putting that out because yeah. it does get kind of lost in because it was last year's planning into this year yeah. where we kind of promised, I guess we said we promised reduction later on. Um, I mean, the deal I remember the discussion, I think, was that we were going to end up at the end up with cutting a section, but we were going to take a little longer getting there because you had a way we had worked out to keep this teacher, you know, very gainfully employed. For the last year before she retired right. okay and this worked out a little differently than anticipated but we're still come to the same point correct yeah. okay so all right so let's move on um enrollment is a big part of this conversation as we move forward to consider options to reduce the budget from the 6.83 percent so uh, the first thing that we talked about is now that we know uh, at least at this point we do not need to hold the rural aid funds for any additional McKinney Vento funding unless something changes in the next six months. Uh, we have uh, about 38,000 left in rural aid, and uh, we would recommend using that 1% uh, reduction for the budget, so almost 34,000. 1% of the budget is like $33,585 or something like that. Um, so we're saying use 1% of the remaining rural aid to help offset the budget there. Um, and then we are recommending a staffing reduction of $60,000. Um, we talked about, you know, what does that look like? Is it multiple staff? Is it IAs? Is it teachers? Is it something else? You know, and, and that's really a internal administrative decision. We don't have to get into the nitty gritty of that. Um, I don't think at least. No, not tonight. Definitely not tonight. Um, it's, it's the, in, I mean, because that's basically just for, so we make a recommendation. If you don't like the recommendation, we come back and give you another recommendation. Um, school committee should not get in the process of saying, um, you know, dictating we want to see the third grade cut. I mean, you could make no. you could make the suggestion or, hey, we're concerned about that class boy being too low, but you really, it does go back to the, um, the school to recommend the cuts. You say you want it lower, we come back to what we think operationally you can get lower. So I'm just kind of saying in process, and we have to discuss process, that's fine too, to feel free to, don't feel like that's, don't feel like you're walking on ice on any or any children or any of that kind of stuff. Feel free to ask questions like, can we do this and do that? And many times we cross those lines because it's, it's a small group and 
it's an intimate group in the sense of uh, you're not, you know, 30,000 person school district. You know what I mean? It's, it's, you're, it's stuff, you know, intimately who people are and that kind of stuff. But there is some separation there. So we're looking at reducing a staff person. And we actually haven't finalized what that would be. Um, however, right now, there's no, it would have to be a reduction. There's not a retirement in line right now. An additional retirement. There's not an additional retirement. So there is, there is, um, yeah. So, so within these funds, I think what you're trying to say is that this is actual people real that are, are working here, whether it's mm -hmm. one person, two people, whatever it pans out right. to be. The other thing I want to say is, you know, obviously we would have more conversations if we were talking about um, reducing program, you know, people sort of get worried that like, oh, you know, you're going to cut the arts or you're going to cut the librarian when, you know, those are typically some of the first things to go when you hear about schools reducing budgets. And obviously we would have more conversation about that at this level before those decisions were made. Um, but based on staffing, it really looks like people that are in a classroom. I think Based on enrollment, so I say based on staff, and mm -hmm. I stick it. Based on enrollment, it looks like big classroom staff. Um, so that would reduce us another 1.8%. And then, uh, as the town has um, helped us out in the past with employee separation costs, we could submit and ask for the town to fund the $55,000 in retirement um, expenditures. And what I want to say there is while we're talking about reducing the budget by 1.65%, if we pull that off, it is still an expense for the town. So the town has to absorb that in some way, shape or form. It just doesn't fall in our budget. So it's sort of falsifying what we're asking for, putting it in two separate bucket, buckets, just like capital is in another bucket. Right. Go ahead. The 55,000 surprises me. Is that just for the two positions, two retirements? Mm -hmm. Each one is 25 to 30? Mm -hmm. Has that been that much before? Yeah. yeah. That's a normal number. We ha we're, we're, with our last contract negotiation, we sunsetted that benefit. I understand, <laughs> but that sunsetted for anybody who is new to the system. As of a year and a half ago, yeah. yeah. So it's going to take us 30 years to mm -hmm. see that impact. What, and if, uh, OK. I, I had thought somehow it was more like a 20,000. Depends on their years of service. Yeah. So and how much sick days they have banked. And there's different pieces of it. So there's some different components where if you take, you know, the multi-year longevity, it the math works out different. So it's a formula. And we have a running sheet so that we can be prepared for these conversations. And so we probably... This is probably we got another 20 years or something to before this all works its way through the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the retirees have been very dependable. Haven't had a lot of this. Which is amazing. Yes. Until right. we get to this point, and then right. yeah. you know we have. But it's it's, 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 I mean, it's no, it's a contract. I'm, I'm yeah. not I'm not debating any of that. It's just yeah. what it. And it's deserved. Because when you when you have at some point down the road we'll have a discussion with town hall about this and then it you want to go into that informed yep. that's all that's the only reason i'm asking sure okay. so you know because it seems like you know essentially that asking the town to fund the employees i mean that was something that came from the town because they said you didn't trust the school okay they didn't trust the school that if uh you know, that it would, you know, this is a number that's bouncing all over the place. And, and then you come in one year and say, well, we got high retirement recalls. Yeah. And then the next year, we don't have any. You don't change your baseline back to the, where it was and so on. And so it was like the only way we're going to be able to trust this thing is if we pull it out and just fund it separately. And it makes sense to fund it that way. But it does. We do have to remember in years where it goes up, the town also has only so much money. So you, you really do have to. When especially when it's a you know I mean, percent you just, and a half of that, you just want to make sure you know what you're talking about, and not giving any bad information. Because yeah. I think there is support for continuing to do it the same way, even though it's somewhat grudging support because composition of the board has changed. And I think there's, I'm sure there's more trust, but it may be still like, yeah, this is probably a sensible way to do it. Yeah, and some of our, a couple of our districts do have this built into their budget because they're larger schools and they have 
one a year regularly. Right. You know, Frontier builds in for three a right. year because of the size of their staff. But Conway, Sunderland, and Wheatley, just, you just don't have capacity to build in a 2% budget placeholder, really, when you're not going to have it the next year, so necessarily. Um, so it is great if the town can continue to support it, but it's also just a reminder that it's still a bill that they have to pay on behalf of the school. I don't want that to get lost in translation as we're talking about budget reduction. So is the rural aid, is the rural aid their number the pretty much the balance that's left in it at this point? Um, there's about 38,000. I think we're going to get to it maybe on the next slide. So no questions about any of these okay. options for reduction. Are, are you sort of straw polling us tonight about whether you want, whether we want these included going um, next month? That's up to you. You know, you, we look for guidance and, you know, would love to hear your feedback on what you think, but if you also need to sit on it and we wait and come back to it in February, then that's what we do as well. I mean, for me, A and C are very easy. Um, but I didn't understand when I previewed this, I didn't understand that B was actually cutting somebody in a classroom right now. So I'm not ready to. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting a decision meeting tonight. Yeah. That's for, that's for darn sure. Um, it was more, I guess, having discussions and maybe giving, we want more information on this or what is this, you know, those kind of things. Um, I guess that this kind of where I'm at, that's who we are in our normal kind of, Every way we get a little bit deeper we, and we, then get some we had a bit of discussion last year about uh, our policy with aid with the aids that we we had where we have a you know one in each classroom policy but he said it wasn't a requirement and like deerfield had you know maybe aids in you know some percentage a large percentage but not every classroom where they rotated the or whatever and that the one thing that was i think this is fair to say that the you know there is certainly more turnover often turnover among the aides mm -hmm. um, more so than you might find among the teachers and so that if there was a way of if you needed to find savings here and there was a way that it was somebody that in fact had decided to you know take their their work someplace else you know again most likely an aid or something like that then that has a obvious advantage of that you're not you know laying off somebody is a right yes that's, that's a bad you know that's that's real bad i mean i one of the things i was proud of stuff here going through the whole COVID time was you know, we didn't do any of that. Right. And I thought that was really admirable. And so that um, I look at this and the number is, uh, you know, it's a big number. And obviously, you know, you take away AMC and the number gets more tolerable. Um, so I don't know if it's going to be necessary or not, but it's it's something that you need to be thinking about. Right. It is. But, but if you think of if you can, you know, do it without saying to somebody, sorry, you just lost your job here. Right. I'd be really unhappy if we had to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't want to do that either, just right. to be clear. Now, I don't you know. know. You know, I asked this evening to Jeff, I just came from the Capital Planning Committee meeting, and, you know, obviously the town budget, you know, where's the town budget? Who knows? Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know where the, we don't know what the governor's budget is, even though that may not have a lot of surprises. Mm -hmm. um, don't know what, uh, you know, I have no idea at this point what the town budget is going to be like. Um, last year was an exceptional year. They had uh, a huge amount of new growth that finally they came online. And so, uh, you know, basically we, we kept, if you remember, we kept basically a pretty large budget increase in our plan all the time, waiting to see if we were going to be asked to cut it. Right. And we were never asked to cut. It. You know, the selectmen finance pretty went along with it and the town voted for it. And here we are. Um, this year, uh, you know, my gut feeling is that 6% would be a real problem. Um, and I don't know whether, you know, is 4% okay, but maybe not, or is you really need 3% or, you know, if you do, if I'm taking off 2.65 here, I'm getting down to four and a little over four, you know, that's certainly getting, that's certainly getting, uh, that's, that's way closer to being tolerable. You know, it's not the kind of one like you got to be kidding me 
reaction you're going to get. It's like, mm, that's a little more than I was hoping for reaction. But again, who knows? Because, you know, I mean, it's good to spend all the time doing all the, you know, my item on all this because we don't have any guidance yet either. I, it, it, I know it comes off colder when I say it this way, but, you know, when we, we and you folks are responsible for a budget that is reasonable to the town, and I do get concerned when we're having class sizes under 10. And what is fiscally responsible for the town? And if we're going to go to the town on a flip side, if we're going to go to town last year and say we need to add a position, while in, in our population is going to only is only about ten students more this year than it's going to be next year you know, as we proceed, if we're going to ask for position, we also have to be able to say we also pull back. And I know people's lives are connected to it, but on a positive side as well, there may be other spots open in the district, the greater district, and teachers. Right now, it's their market. So I want to put that out there that, you know, we do, well, we never want to say goodbye to anyone. It is a natural occurrence within your budget. So it's the, the worst part of the job is maybe you have to retract. But we do also take opportunities to expand when we can. So I just, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to expand, you also, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, administratively, I always say to a principal, like, oh, I know someone would be good for that job. It's like, whoever you build to hire, you also have to be able to let go. It is, it is a business in the end. And I'm just going to put that out there because I don't want the emotion to get in, in the way of, we have a class of nine, and you have to go in, you have to go in front of town me to explain why it's important. And there may be a reason for a class of nine. We may have some needs in that classroom, that kind of thing. So I just want to kind of put that out there. The other thing is that what we've looked at in Deerfield, when we had, they've had to do the same kind of thing of consolidation and um, reduction in staffing is that based on the needs of the classroom, do we, do you do almost like a half reduction where you lose a teacher, you lose a section, but you have an add an IA. So they have more support for those, depending on what the needs of each classroom are. And that's gonna be something that's gonna be conversation as we go through is it, you know, we talk, you know, let's talk with Ben and then talking with people, we end up having to reduce one and now there's 24 students in the classroom. What are the needs in that classroom? And how are they going to be met? And you're going to have to get other adult support in that classroom. And how is that going to work? And there's going to be some restructuring. But Sunderland is um, FTE heavy mm -hmm. for the size of school. Mm -hmm. And that's it's a, that's the reality that I, know, I have to share with you. And you know, responsible. We're responsible for making it heavy. You know, through the years, I've been here long enough, being here six years. Um, at the same time, you know, it, it, they are reducing in size. I mean. Um, when I started, you were closer to 200, right. over 200. At some point, point, now we're, now point we were like, we're going to run out of space and we're not going to, right. you know. And so it's just a, it's a natural flow and you do it with, you do it with, you know, with the thought, you think everything and all the components to it, but, um, and, and maybe we don't have to do it this year, but I'm just saying that it, it, uh, you have to have this serious conversation if it is the direction you have to go. And I, and I really applaud you for your, sort of it seems to me really sensible reasoning about you know how you have to approach this and, you know you got to deal with things when they go one direction you got to deal with them when they go the other direction and come up with the best educational model that works for the group of students that we got um do you know based on enrollment now the rural aid bill that we got this bunch obviously was you know, it's not something that shows up on the cherry sheet. Mm -hmm. It comes out real late with the amount, so it's real hard to plan on it. So there would reasonably be, you know, back to the way that school choice was handled for a number of years, is you spend it, you get it, and then you spend it the following year. Yeah, and the challenge is, is that it has to be spent in the current year. So we basically have to, in order to use it in this way, I have to... But it's the, she's really going to spend school choice yes. for you're next gonna, year. You're basically, going to do the whole shift of yes. yes. Okay. And that's a good question, though. So Shelly and I have been talking about, and even um, you know, you know, I, I point with Jessica because she's been so much involved with the rural aid. But in where we talked about consistency is the number one thing. No, my number one concern. You know, because we right now, you know, when we build our budgets and we look at Chapter Seven funding, our budgets continue to grow larger than clearly larger by hundreds of thousands larger than the chapter 70 is making up for. Rural aid has been the, the difference to make the state's contribution to the district. And eventually at some point that rural aid should be being used to offset the operation budget because or else the town can't keep up. And I'm looking at this in all the small schools, um, all the schools, um, 
where you, it just doesn't mathematically doesn't work out, but you add rural aid in with the chapter 70, then all of a sudden you're at a percentage of state aid where it's not great, but it's more reasonable. Mm -hmm. Right now it's, it's not reasonable with what we get without adding rural aid. And so Shelly and actually we were talking about even prior to budget season about at what point do we take a risk you know, so we, we do the risk every year for um, transportation for Frontier because regional transportation is supposed to be is, is supposed to be done 100 percent and rarely has it been. And so we pick a number of what, what percentage if they do cut, how low will they go? And so like 80 percent has been the number. Some schools risk as much as um, will go as much as or we've actually sorry, the other way around. We've actually been a conservative as much as 60 percent, you know, further back when they were touching. Um, transportation with the same kind of ideas I look at really can we expect to get as much this year or if we get slightly less will we still get one percent mm -hmm. because it, it is a good point to bring up is we if we take rural aid and we spend it here and they don't give us rural aid next year we're down a percent right out of the block you know it's the same kind of thing we did with you know the estimate well, thing to the same thing yeah. so it, that's why like one percent is something that we could fight as a as a school and as a town not that we have much more, but had we had more, if we had the full two percent, that would be one, one of the one of the questions. Can you tell from? I assume they use the October one enrollment for their uh, calculations for rural aid, depending to put you in whatever. It's one of the things that go into whichever tier you're in. One is your economic situation, which I think will qualify for, mm -hmm. and the other was your opposite of density, your lack of density. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you tell from our October one? numbers whether we'll still qualify for the same tier in next year's rural aid calculation if they don't change the way they calculate it. Good question. Yeah. But I think, I think our numbers have only gone down. They're going yeah. down. Yeah. And if they're going we're down, down. We're, we're tier one right now. We're, we're we're, the, we got in tier one this year. Correct. Okay. And my question, which I think the answer to is yes, we will qualify for tier one again, is can you tell for sure from the numbers as to whether that's going to be the case? Because I think you can, you ought to be able to. As long as they don't change the I could, rules. I could also call, um, there's a great person that works for uh, MASS, I mean, Mars rather, um, that's Massachusetts Association of Regional Schools, um, Kelly, um, as in, Julie, Julie Kelly. Um, she, might, she might have a formula that we can plug it in. The other thing is, will the governor's budget have the recommendations on early? Uh, I don't remember if that can come out. Uh, yeah, the governor's budget includes we'll, it. We'll have rural aid. So yeah. the governor's budget which comes out on the 24th. It's so it'll have an amount for rural aid, but it won't have a splitting it up into the well, we'll know if they cut rural aid. Right. So right. Right, it may be adjusted based on what category you're in. So you're going to need both pieces of information. But the first one is, are they totally funding it? Mm -hmm. Or even, I don't know, I guess. Funding but, it the same, at least. As right. I mean, the fact they just did nine, they just did some nine C cost flows. Folks haven't seen right. that in the paper. Mm -hmm. It did not affect education. It did not affect municipalities directly. Um, so, you know, so some strategic cutting. So the question is, what is going to be Governor Healy's mood when it comes to expanding, you know, um, rural aid next year? So is it, you know, so, but if it comes in at the 15 million again, we're going to, we'll, even if we get some reduction, we're still right at one percent. So then we'll know safely that we'll be able to apply that <laughs> moving forward. Right. I mean, we, we our, our starting figure was what low fifties. Yeah, so fifty five. Right. So, you know, as long as we stay in tier one, right. and they don't really like you know chop it in half. Or, I mean, even if, if we stay in tier one and they, you know, chop it from fifteen million down to ten, we still have got more than the thirty three right. thousand. That's why I'm saying it's a safe number. Right. That's why we picked one. We picked one percent. Like, where do you start? Do you throw the whole thing at it? We're like, right. let's go with what the idea we had before with one percent. And um, yeah, you know, we were talking about today on other budgets as well. Is eventually okay. this has to be rolled in as yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Let's keep moving. Um, so I want to look at revolving funds and talk about that. Um, our budget is not fully funded in the general fund. We always supplement. So these are the other funding sources we'll use next year. School choice, early childhood revolving, school lunch revolving, uh, IDEA, which is a special education federal grant, and then Title I. So that is an additional almost 600000 So between the general fund and the supplemental accounts that we use, we're looking at roughly 
four million dollars to fully cover all of the operations of the school, which based on our, our estimated enrollment uh, for next year of 170 students, we're looking at about 24,000 per pupil cost. Uh, and then just some of the other accounts that we've used over the years, circuit breaker, special ed revolving, ESSER, ESSER will not have any money remaining uh, after the end of this year, or at least by summer, because we may use some for summer programming, the rural aid balance for 24, and then next year, obviously, is subject to appropriation like we just talked about. So while I'm giving you the info for next year, I also want you to have what the projections uh, will be. And I like this graphic particularly because she's like peeking, like she's not quite sure. And this is sort of how I feel when we're talking about revolving fund projections because there's some unknown with this and it is a projection and it is a guessing game. While school choice is probably the one that I can predict the most based on current uh, enrollment numbers for revenue and expenses. The other ones really fluctuate. We don't know what enrollment for early childhood is going to be and what our tuition is. I'm basing it based on this year's numbers. Uh, school lunch, same thing. I'm sort of going off what we're bringing in and what we're spending this year. Um, so not only is it a little bit uh, scary to look at the projections, um, and kind of play a guessing game with it. I think it's most important to point out that expenses are exceeding revenue yeah. in all of these accounts. You can really clearly see that. And for me, a couple of these accounts are getting to a point where I feel uncomfortable. $20,000 left in early childhood is not a whole lot. If you have one student that you aren't anticipating needs a one-to-one -one that ends up needing a one-to-one, -one, you do not have enough funds to cover your high <laughs> position. Um, so I would like to see this closer to um, 30 or 40,000 at a minimum. And school choice, this is a multi-year. We've been talking about this. We've seen our numbers go down primarily because we had um, some high special education claims. Those students are no longer enrolled. So we lost a significant amount of revenue here. So we're having to back off. So when I talked about the level service budget having a revolving fund adjustment of 50,000, this is why, because if you add 50,000 back onto school choice here, we're at 60,000 left at the end of your balance next year, which is a very uncomfortable number. If we have an out of district placement, the transportation contract comes in way high. Like I said, any one-to-ones will really be in a bind where we don't have adequate funds to, to cover. So this is something that we have to keep an eye on. And I'm really worried about the school choice number getting down to well, we were there five years ago. And so after we talk about, so we never gave the final percentage number where we'd be at if we did the A, If B, those C. three components were to push through, it'd be 2.83 or 2.8. And it might be something where we push back. 2.38%. So we might want to say we want to get that back up to three percent to go to the town or 3.2 3.3 to go to the town if we're going to take the lump to cut a position it doesn't mean you have to go all the way down to the bottom we might want to say let's save more school choice so we're not forced to be doing that kind of reductions the following year you know you understand what i'm saying like you know spread your money over the several meals of the several years so to speak so because i think the town probably will have an appetite for something just over three <laughs> rather than just say how low can we go and just go there mm -hmm. and then put you know get more savings in school choice and so that we have that buffer for other things so just just thought as we those are the the, the finite stuff as we make some of the major price decisions about how we can um I mean, ourselves that's later, if we're going to take some pain now, and that's an easy point of view to argue because if I'm looking at 220 in revenues and 261 in expenses and saying no, a negative 41 is that you got to get off, you got to do better than that for where your trend line is going to kill you, and you got to get that number down to 20, let's say, or right. or something that you know shows a way so that the curve is going to bottom yeah. rather than <clears> just <throat> run into the zero. Right. So for me the sixty thousand dollar reduction in staffing while that is really hard to swallow because it is people and we're all human and we all care about each other and we certainly don't want to let anyone go we can't continue on the trajectory that we're at and maintain our staffing because next year if expenses stay at 260 and revenue doesn't grow 
we're talking about another 2% going back on general fund. Right. So there has to be reductions and the only place is staffing to do that. There's, there's no other extra fat um, or low hanging fruit to, to cut from our budget. So um, strictly looking at numbers, it makes sense to do what we're recommending. And we know that there's a lot of other considerations to take in the process. Question on school lunch. Mm -hmm. On the previous page where you listed revolving funds and grants, and you showed 69,800 coming out of school lunch. That's just for wages for staff. That the I was wondering, I was wondering if when you got to the 125, if that includes like major equipment and stuff like Not that. Not equipment, it's just um, consumables, Literally. actual food and product to serve. Okay. Um, you know, if they're using anything disposable for service so or, are we is running a twenty five thousand deficit in that account like what we're doing so we don't have a good handle on school lunch at the moment because we've built up our reserves so much right. we've bought new equipment we've been trying to increase food quality we now have a float cafeteria person who fills in when someone is absent um the state is pushing schools to spend their excess funds because they only want you to carry, uh, I believe it is three months of your expenses as your balance. And we're exceeding that. Everyone in the state is exceeding it. It's the message keeps coming out. I don't know if you're hearing it, but we're hearing it at my level that, you know, buy equipment, hire more staff, give raises. Well, but the, to fairness to all the school districts, we didn't know what was going to happen in exactly. school lunch. So everybody right. sat on the money because if we were to transition back to pay lunch, all the systems had to be put back in and you know, there would be software updates. There would be like, there would be, there was all these expenses that they were fearing and fearing that number of students who were buying lunch would then be suddenly reduced. You know what I mean? So there was, again, it makes sense why those people have money because exactly. the state's been unpredictable. Yep. <clears throat> um, so I think we are on track with, uh, Pat McCarthy's our new food service director. He's doing a phenomenal job with, um, making sure that lunch counts and breakfast counts are accurate. Whereas the last couple of years with the way that things have happened between COVID and what the state was requiring, it's been a little bit more loosey goosey. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to see where we can become more predictable with what we're spending, uh, and what we have coming in for revenue. Um, so we can't forever spend $25,000 over. So there's going to be a point where we have to look at what exactly is that. Um, Sunderland at some point, I think, had was paying some of the cafeteria staff out of general fund, not in revolving, because revolving wasn't making enough money to cover everything. We've shifted that really since COVID because we've had more revenue coming in. So the food service director being paid out of the school lunch fund. Yeah. Now, yes. That could be shifted back. Exactly. So it, it's just another fund that we have to keep a close eye on. But having $80,000 in the school lunch account is not typical in any of our small schools. Um, I think when I first started here, all the schools, maybe if they were lucky, had $10,000 surplus, which is really where you should be. You don't need to hold money. That All of your fund money should be coming and going directly back into the program. So you know, we're okay overspending for a little while, especially as Patrick, you know, works on menu changes and training staff and, you know, trying to increase the quality of food that we're serving. Um, and I think we'll... And I would say, when you look at those lines too, like given a certain year, if I were to go back to the year, the I still remember that year where I handed out pink sheets of like, like what we're going to have to cut if we had to make adjustments where we had a, every $10,000 increment we had to pull from every single line item, maybe we'd look at school lunch differently and yeah. do that shift now instead of having a small kind of thing there. But I don't think it's that kind of budget year. Right. You know? Like I said, we don't know what town, we don't have any idea what the town's position is. <laughs> well, now that we have a budget that's, you know, this is our first, this is public meeting. So yeah. now we can go and we can start having conversations with folks about what are they seeing on their end and, and then, obviously, again, with the governor's budget coming out, and a lot more information going in the next week. I think we just have one, a couple more slides. Um, so we can go quickly. I'm not going to read through all of this. This is just historical info. The thing I want to do point out is that our increases have been on the higher side. I think, you know, going back 2020, 
almost 14%, then budget froze. Under three, I think it's healthy. That's where all of us would like to be, slightly over three, and then the 6.63. So we're on the high end again, and I just wanted us to have that info so we would know. I know story. it's obvious, but just remember it's FY24. You know what I mean? We're in six in both years. You know what I mean? Usually, yeah. you, have, usually you have the projected, I think projected four, but well, usually you have the projected four. because year. we don't really have a decision on it. At some right, point, right. I will add a column that right. shows. I just wanted to say it out loud because I, when I read it, I was like, oh, Oh, no, that's the year before. Yeah. Even, even, yeah. even, even I get, I'm just saying it up. So we've talked about a lot of things. I want to recap before we close out um, our budget drivers, our salaries and wages, uh, facilities and operations, special education costs and transportation. 75% um, of our overall budget goes to direct instruction of the students. Um, and then the scenarios we're looking at, level service came in at 6.34%. Our new requests added just shy of 20,000. So 6.83 is what we're looking at now as our baseline to talk about reductions. And then we presented those three options of, for reductions to you. Um, so next steps, going back to what Jessica asked of what we're looking for, you know, this is the first conversation. It's a lot of information. Um, if you could concretely say, yes, let's use 1% of rural aid, and yes, let's ask the town for the 55,000 in February, I come back with what that budget looks like. Um, and we continue the conversation around staffing and enrollment from that point. If we're not ready to make any of those decisions, that's okay too. Yeah. Or throw a vote on that. A lot of info. It's sure. Yeah. Um, are we all comfortable using the rural aid money? This is basically exactly what the state intended us to do with it, operating expenses. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah, and yeah. um, and putting the retirements on as a town meeting warrant item, we we've, we've yeah. got lots of historical precedent for that in Sunderland. Right. Yeah. yeah. Those are easy. Yeah. Okay. And so on the other things, would so one is we'll start having conversations with the town that this is so we can start getting a um a feeling about how they feel about um. You know the fifty-five thousand there, mm -hmm. um, and then I think hearing you know even as we were talking about it, we have to firm up all those numbers to class sizes. Even though we have the October mm -hmm. one report, we need to do what the current one is as well there, so that mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing there. Um, I mean, we're going to still start having more conversations about there are some different options if you look at the different classes. Just you don't just go to the lowest. You there might be other there's other factors in there. Um, you know and yeah, you know, we'll start getting more information there so that at the next meeting, if we end up going that direction, if you're asking questions, we have a better plan. Um, I, guess I suppose we should have, I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is, should we come back with a proposal of what that step would be? Um, it may be take two months to do it, may, but it might be the March thing, but it also, you want to be able to have... March is a public hearing. Public, public hearing. You want people. You want to have public comment. If you're going to do reductions, there should be some feedback on that. We should know how it's going to impact students. Yeah. Right. And there's a lot of details there because each class has a different personality, <laughs> so to speak. Um, I mean, and different needs and how those needs will be met and that kind of stuff. Um, it's it's easier. With the difference also from a larger district to a smaller district. In a larger district, you're cutting on staff position. Administration goes off with it and they figure it out over the next few months. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's not it's not a, you know, it's not as pinpoint. Um, which technically as a school committee you can also do. You could say you're gonna have to reduce by one and we have until we have until the start of school to figure out what that's going to be based on whatever that kind of thing. And so um and of course we come back to you on that. So I'm just saying that out loud because it is, um, yeah, it's not easy. I don't think by 7th of February when we meet again that this well, the town's gonna have much idea of where its budget is, but we have to keep moving forward. They'll have the governors for a general idea. They'll start to have some basic numbers. And the big numbers are, you know, what they're gonna get in the two regional schools. Right. Um, it, remember, your your timeline is also that you have your public hearing at the beginning of March and yes. your votes at the end of March. You can have as many meetings as you want. Your public hearing, you know, the budget. But we don't have to. Budget have. can't go up. It, just, it can go down after that. So you can come in with a higher budget and then still right. be working on. So there's still a lot of time for input and 
other ideas and to see other ways of sharpening our pencils if, if that's the direction we have to go to. But there was no vote tonight anyways on it. It's, yeah. it, is, it kind of sits and yeah, so yeah. <laughs> And just to reiterate, like the town will get the full line by line item budget. I know they want to see that. They'll get more of a narrative, like I usually submit to you all that's, you know, paragraph driven. Yeah, yeah, but that's not that's not for the public here. Right. But in case anyone's watching wondering, yeah. um, this doesn't give us a whole lot, you know, or or before it gets out that this was what was discussed was not that level of detail that they want to see. We know that they have that, so we'll have that ready. March or February um i will have probably a line by line for march based on the two reductions because we know we have some direction now mm -hmm. but the march meeting will really have the full february february yes february. february will have more and then march will be the full package <laughs> Just, you know, yeah sorry it's if you only had right, if you only had one budget you'd have it i'd have it all yeah, right now for you if i only had one budget <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Billy. Any other questions right now? Okay. It is late. Let's keep moving. Uh, all right. Our next agenda item is a vote about air purifiers for classrooms. Um, I am the originator of this uh, agenda item. I've been asking about classroom air purifiers for about two years now. Uh, they are recommended by the CDC. Um, prior to the pandemic, there was plenty of evidence that air quality in classrooms um, has a major impact on learning. Um, that when you have clean air in classrooms, test scores go up pretty significantly. Um, and now we are still in a pandemic. Um, they can uh, really meaningfully reduce transmissions of COVID in addition to removing allergens and asthma triggers and wildfire smoke. Um, right now, none of the classrooms in this building are meeting uh, CDC or ASHRAE or Lancet standards for air exchanges. So plan B, according to those bodies, those um, advisory bodies, is to use air purifiers. They just plug into the wall um, to keep cleaning the air. Uh, this has to be a school committee vote because Darius can't decide to put them into just one building. He'd have to decide to do it for all of the buildings. That's a much bigger budget item, but we can vote it for this building. Um, uh, so I'm asking for us to vote for this, um, not only for health and learning for everybody, but also as an equity measure for people who've got medically vulnerable people in the community who are still at really high risk of severe outcomes from catching COVID. Um, the air purifiers will not prevent all transmissions in classrooms. Uh, per CDC data, they would prevent about two out of every five that would happen. So that's two out of every five people who won't miss five plus days of school, who won't be risking long-term complications from catching COVID. And it completely stops two continuing transmission chains through the community, which helps to protect medically vulnerable people. Um, so I guess I will make a motion and then we can ask for budget information from Darius on this. Um, I, I make a motion that we direct the superintendent to procure and supply as many air purifiers as are needed to outfit every classroom appropriately and instruct staff to have them running when students are present. A second. Do we know what this will cost? So it depends on what what the um, air exchange rate you want. Okay. And so the if you're looking for five air exchanges per hour, the current units that are in our building can't besides the one that the one model that's in the library right now, there's another one somewhere else in the building yeah. into a thousand square foot room which are, we're, our classrooms are just around 900 and, 900 and change. Um, that is the only unit that can be do an entire room um, of that size to get, basically we're around between two and three. So I'm gonna round down because I think we're closer to two on most in most air exchanges in rooms. Um, and again, that's air exchanges before people were watching this, before doors being open and windows being open or those kind of things. Um, and those units can do that if they're on high. And so there, there is, and this is where you know, Jessica and I had some conversations on this, where it gets more, it gets a little bit more complicated than ordering and unboxing and just putting them into classrooms because the unit itself, in order to do that size space, um, 
again, the particular one that's in the, you know, there's one right by the door, I keep pointing over there, I'm not pointing at you, <laughs> Megan, um, is a $500 unit. And it would have to be on high in order to do the classroom. And when it's on high, it's loud. And so, you know, and we want to even turn it on so you can even hear how high, loud it is when it's on high. And so if you're going to run them on low, then you need to have multiple units. And so this is kind of where it's like, it's more than, and then the, the once we buy those, then we're going to need to budget for filters as such as well. So that's what I'm saying. This is why I asked Jessica, like I said, I'm not going to make the, the change in this because it's not, um, while air filtration is important, and, and we do have some within this building, a complete overhaul to go to CDC standard that they changed this summer in the, in the midst of things is very difficult to do, very expensive for us to do. And so right now there's 11 classrooms that would need, by, if, we, if we use the ones we have, and we use the ones, there's three different models that we have currently in the building that are being used. There, there are, um, so, um, there are ones that it basically goes by price, to be honest with you. The ones that were, uh, we have these things called Medfly. They're really, they only do about 300 square feet. They really are, they are in classrooms. And I imagine um, when we bought them, the idea was getting something is better than nothing. And if it's near teacher, they may have been for a teacher accommodation, if it's near a teacher's desk, that particular area is gonna have more air filtration than an entire classroom. And so, um, again, going back to, depending on how they're used and such, um, you're looking at $500 a classroom. Right now there's 11 classrooms that would need them. Um, and that would be using the other ones that are mid range at 250. You're not really getting five air exchanges or kind of, Fibbing that we're getting by very changes. Um, because even on, on high, um they would be a couple hundred square feet short. Um this isn't talking about other larger areas that would need even larger units, such as the this room really should have something even bigger than that unit that's over there. The cafeteria and the gymnasium would have to have, you know, industrial size units that would be several thousand dollars. Um and so that's what I'm saying. We we could put the simple unit in each classroom. But I just wanna be clear, if the vote is that we wanna have CDC level air exchange, it's gonna to have to get a kind of report together to, the, to see exactly what that would entail, what kind of unit would need, what they'd recommend for each classroom. We also have an issue with wiring in classrooms. There's only so many outlets. We talked about that um, uh, before we were talking about adding electricity to the building, that there's only so many different places. So placement of them is going to be limited to either one of I might help me out here banks I don't know that in some classrooms one in the building or another room or the other end of the room um there, right there, there's outlets mid wall in each okay. in each classroom but it's you know you're not putting it in the center of the classroom okay right it's just, it's just you know. right that's just another factor that's it's it's in there so um yeah so basically if the committee wants to direct to get the, and, and I imagine there's other units out there. This is one that was, this actual one that was in the library was donated by someone who put a lot of time and care into picking what he considered the most robust unit on um, the new wave. Um, again, is, am I reading that one right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, it's a $500 unit. So you're talking about, 11 rooms if you want to just that's just classrooms um $3,500 but what I'm, I'm just saying is I'm not getting you CDC level air exchanges and so you know if you want air if the, if the vote is to put air purifiers in every make sure there's one every classroom that can increase the air rates I would recommend that we do the $500 unit um because you're going to get you know more bang for your buck even on the lower speeds you're going to get more exchange but you're not getting five air exchanges per hour. All right. Okay. Not, you're not getting the three added to the two to get you five air exchanges per hour. The three, the two that the classrooms already are doing. Unless it's on high. And that's on high. But even on low, so I'm just like, that's kind of, it, it gets to semantics, but it's also like if the, if the district is saying that this is the goal we wanna do, maybe getting the air purifiers those particular models in first and then working toward other goals can be a longer planning process. But I'm just saying that you can't just buy those units, put them in and then have five air exchanges per hour. You're gonna have to get a larger unit 
Um, and that this can be a little bit more to do. There's more to do around that. It's a little silly that the units are rated by square footage when you're talking about volume, so you need the third dimension. It doesn't count the ceiling height. Correct. And they, they so it's, well, it's they, really they, they say, they, no, they do say it's very nine foot ceiling. Uh, oh, do they? Eight. Okay. And, and this is when I'm looking at Amazon specs, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I, I imagine there's other specs where you can go directly to the company, but they use volume of a large room is usually a household. You know what I mean? Okay. And so then, then there's classroom grade ones, and they they go up in price significantly um, from the household market ones to whatever. Um, you know, and what's what's the uh, what's the anticipated source of funds for whatever we do? Right now, the only funds that you have available um, it's either school choice or the the remaining of the rural aid. Um, well, I was going to suggest another one, which I'm not sure if, if, what, if there's any money left in it or how much, if there is some, is the uh, the fund that the, uh, that the school has access to, the representative gift that the gentleman made to the school to improve things at the school, and which I know a lot has been spent in the library. And other stuff, and I have no idea how much it's been spent or how much it's left. It seems to me that something, one of the one of the comments from school committee members when that was presented here was that uh, hope that it would affect positively as many kids as possible. My pushback on that would be only that Ben's worked more with teachers and stuff. And there's a kind of like a committee that's kind of been owning that funds for us to swoop in and take it uh, without their yeah. permission. I, I mean, we can ask their permission to use it. That's what I mean. There might be a, oh. there certainly might be a process that you know would be uh, you know the proper way to go about doing it. I just thought I'd bring it up because yeah. thinking maybe well, we hadn't considered this. Right. I mean, I'd rather I would rather use rural aid rather than going after. That gift money. Okay. You know what I mean? If you're gonna, you know, that money is that money is there right now. Right. You know, it's you know, it's kind of waiting for its next I mean, it, pull. It, it, right. I think there's around twenty thousand dollars left in that. Okay. And um a lot of those monies have been spent towards um steam related um projects or right. hands-on learning experiences. Yeah, I like how you're thinking, but my recollection of sort of the spirit of that gift is that it should be for fun things for the kids. And the therapy of would be just a bit of fun. <laughs> <laughs> that does keep them healthy and cool. They're important, they're important areas, but just not fun. <laughs> so, I, again, I, I think the other question, um, are, are we looking to have an air purifier in every space where there is a person in the building right so including all offices all classrooms and the cafeteria the gymnasium as, as well and i don't know what the price of the industrial ones would be i would think you would you know where they spend the majority of their time you're not going to make anything perfect right okay you're not going to get you know, you can always, if you don't walk away thinking, oh, gee, we could have, you know, somehow done a better job. Well, you really got too much money, you know, or something. And and so I'm not saying it's a compromise, but it's like, how do you get the best bank to buck? The best bank to buck is to use it where the kids are, which is in the classrooms. Okay. And then the other thing I would say is that my judgment of, you know, does something with, raise the odds that we're going to have healthy kids you know more so than otherwise um and actually you know how do we judge whether it does that to me making that judgment is a little bit different from just well how many air exchangers do we get which to me is sort of a number that somebody tosses out there and it's sort of like well does that mean that if if five is what you're supposed to have that four and a half is no good you know, and I look and say, well, if we're getting two and we up that to three or four, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. And don't go feeling you got to gotta go, you know, go through a bunch of other hoops. Okay. Trying to get to this five standard. And we don't know what the difference between five and four is a big deal or not. But, mm -hmm. you know, if we're doing something that is 
doable and affordable and we can get installed fairly quickly without a whole lot of rigmarole it's not going to make so much noise that the kids are going to have trouble paying attention to their learning which to me is actually a big deal um we ought to be doing something like that and not worrying about whether we meet the five exchanges standard it's still harm reduction it's still um, yeah. better and i would think that the sound i mean if they're using fans in the warm weather in the classroom mm -hmm. the sound of that i would imagine would be equal or less on an air purifier mm -hmm. until like a box fan um and i look at something like what i think Darius is saying which is you put in there something that's going to improve things okay with anything you put in you're not going to sure how much you know and then if you put in something that makes your room the area in there just perfect but then the kids have got to go in the cafeteria you know and gym and whatever and it's like you know we do something and i think it will help and it's still gonna just have to wait and see mm -hmm. my you know and i don't know how we put motion out but i'm not i still have to confirm what the wording is but how you want it but <laughs> i mean is that a reasonable way to move forward yeah i mean i guess i would just add um if we're talking about it in terms of COVID transmission, the highest risk activities are yelling and singing. So I would make sure the music room is included. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe brings us up to needing 12 of them. Because there is both yelling and singing. So can we, how do you want the motion to read? Um, instruct the superintendent to, y'all can help me with this, we can redo it if we need to. Instruct the administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To procure, I mean, do, do we need to say the model? Of, no, just, um, if I just I to, think install, we've got an to install uh, uh, air purifiers in all the classrooms plus music room. And instruct staff they should be running when students are present. Is that an okay thing to have in there? Mm -hmm. Really, you can just tell the children they should be running and then they'll be running. Yeah. It's all air purifiers. In the classrooms, music room, and instruct staff to use them. Yeah. Is that enough? Okay with you. Mm -hmm. I'll second that. You ready to vote? Can you try to town first? Give me okay. All right. All in favor? We're there. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for pushing for yeah. for bringing it up, and because if it makes a difference in the health, that's. And my understanding is that there are some kids who experience mold sensitivity in this building. We are mm -hmm. built on a swamp. We are on Swamp Field Drive. <laughs> you could throw a baseball into the marsh. <laughs> Hopefully this will be helpful. Okay. All right, moving on. Committee and chair reports. I've got nothing I need to report. Nothing. One quick thing, just from town capital planning meeting. We submitted uh, three items. Uh, the last year, the rim band stuff, the, uh, the building, uh, the Siemens, new Siemens plan with Deerfield at the same time, and then also electricity upgrades, I think. Um, and then a fourth one, and then the fourth one, which I guess was also put in for a bunch of the mini splits. Okay. My sense that how, you know, if where we were in our discussion this evening, which is very preliminary, but it's got sort of the you know here's the amount of money available here's the amount of things we're asking for is that i'd be real surprised if we didn't get the first three without any problem at all okay <laughs> and i would think it would be reasonably likely we would get it some at least something on the on the uh mini split thing <laughs> okay i was getting no you know we just went through the list so on and, and i was getting no no objection to any of that Great. And and having the town support for the capital override obviously is what's made the difference because we have 
available funds in excess of what we had prior year, prior to the mm-hmm. So it'd be nice to. And then the other thing is that the ARPA uh, money needs to be committed by the end of December. There's 150,000 still uncommitted for the town. Who knows what's going to come up, but at some point, and I was thinking, well, gee, you know, whether we got a couple, you know, good projects on now, and, and uh, you know, if, if if there is something that you know is a reason to ask for for some, for, for our money, and at least you know, bring it up. Right. They could use it to pay the employee separation costs. They could use it for that. Mm. That's about what it's meant, didn't it? Conway did that uh, last year, right? Mm. Conway had four retirements that had to be paid out. Okay. Yeah. They used a good chunk of their arbor for that. Okay. So anyway, I'm just passing this on. Mm-hmm. And they want to know on the, the something like 90000 you put into the mini space, what percent did that represent of the amount to do all the rooms that were eventually planned. I said it was I didn't pull up. I think I'd have to get the report plus or minus a half. Like, or, I probably just come to one of the meetings for that just to talk about that. It's a, it's a to understand the rebate and isn't the it like phases. nine thousand per room though? It is nine thousand per yeah room. We, this was eighty one thousand for nine rooms. But they need to the electric upgrade too. Right. You gotta do the upgrade first. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. I just, I, so I are you asking that. what percentage of the building that what would percentage be of the of the of the eventual, does this represent, you know, is there another 81,000 come before we finish right, the job? Right. Or we can get yeah. you, there's a map. We can get you the map. I, I, and I told, uh, and I told them that, and the other thing that would be useful was I told them that in the different elementary schools, there are some rooms that they are choosing not to do. I can believe you told me that. Maybe I was wrong, or maybe they just haven't gotten around to it or whatever. But it's real nice to be able to have something also that explains what the other three towns are doing. Because you know if they're doing stuff, then you're being left behind. Well, mm-hmm. You know that's a reason to get on board. So. Right. I mean, we prioritized you know working with the building principal about what costs, especially what costs we're using in the summer, and then usually younger. Sometimes it's younger students, especially education students, who a are here in the summer and have less ability to regulate their heat. Um, so you know, but I, we put I, logic into it. I'd be real surprised if we didn't get at least some number. Okay. For work for for Didn't for starting you submit the work. Ben's full plan with our I, request. I mean, they have it here. The, okay. at, as of November, our initial look was that we would need around twenty four or twenty five total units. And this year, and this was nine in this. Okay. Yeah, phase one would have been nine units. Right. Okay. But anyway, there'll be a need for there'll be it could it would be useful to have you know your presence or your you know more information to when it when the time comes to help to help move that along Excuse me. and that's that's all i need to say for now great thanks any other committee reports we have no collaborative report superintendent report just an update that the oil tank work began this week um I don't know if they, they can clear the snow and then they're going to put in the start with the Staging fencing. And... happened. The fence was brought yesterday. Um, some digging Friday, tomorrow. Okay. Possibly. Yeah. Um, the, the temp tank is in. The temp tank is in. And there was back and forth regarding the temp tank. Those of you are, may have heard some of that. <laughs> um, they recommended that we go with a larger temporary tank. Um, they had conversations with Jeff Kravitz about it and so on and forth and they really wanted us to sharpen our pencils and not go that route and just go with more filling of the temporary tank yeah we're learning a lot about tank stuff um you know that there is there's a whole another math to it as well regarding how much fuel is in the current tank where are you going to pump that fuel and how much fuel you don't pump out is left over and how much of the cost of that is to actually dispose of it per gallon and so if we had a larger temporary tank it's all of a math game. How much fuel do you have at the time? Can you do all that? And so I don't know if we made the right call on that. It's, it's going to be $500 one way or the other um, that we, you know, um, but we weren't going to get into a push and pull with the town over. They wanted us to kind of not, we already did one 
um, change order on something else uh, within the project. So we didn't do it on that one, but it's just interesting, these small details as you're going through the projects, like there's good fuel in the tank mm -hmm. and then to a certain level. And then you get to the bottom, there's sludge. There's sludge in all of our tanks and all our homes. And so you only fill a certain capacity. And so, and then you got to pay to remove that fuel, suck that fuel out. And it was toxic because, you know, it's diesel and our town trucks could run on diesel. And so they, you know, they've been doing a lot of different conversations about, it's just interesting. Um, but anyway, so that's, that's, so that's take that project's taking off. Um, we are being, I did send out a superintendent's report. Just the other highlight is that um, the tier focused modern review is occurring next week. Um, you know, basically every three years they come and look at our special education civil rights to make sure we're in compliance with the federal and state regulations around that. And so um, we'll get a report back in 60 days after that visit. Um, business days was like 90 days to let us know where we need to, areas we need to fix up. And so they work with you on that. It's not a gotcha. They kind of say like, you know, when they leave an idea of what you got to fix. Um, right now we're looking pretty good within the audit. Um, seeing, we're not seeing a lot of areas that we're worried about. Okay. Question? Thank you. Uh, we have reached the end of the agenda. We can entertain a motion to adjourn. We'll make a motion. Cross that hand. All in favor? Four zero. Uh, adjourned at eight twenty-two.